if you have uh, here's just a quick preview of, of uh, what we'll cover today uh, highlights of the 2019 year um, we had a lot of uh, seed in sugar maple some pretty wet conditions early on and we'll see the r results of that later uh, pear thrips uh, are sometimes an issue and we'll see that this year not as much uh, tent caterpillars have been a real issue over the previous three years or so and that seems to be abating uh, there was a big increase in certain areas of maple leaf cutter and also of, of anthracnose a fungal disease uh, generally Honestly, the maples are seem to be rebounding a little bit. So we'll we'll cover those topics and uh, start with the heavy flowering and seed. Uh, the the flowers started emerging around the end of April, uh, and were fully expanded by early maple or early May. Sorry, throughout the state. Uh, and, and all that flowering resulted in some heavy seed, which later on in the season uh, contributed to some real thin crowns. Uh, we're mandated by uh, law to produce a report on the health of the forest each year. And one of the activities that we uh, are involved with to try to uh, quantify uh, forest health issues is to fly over the state in a, in a grid pattern and looking out the window we try to map out areas of bad health. Uh, so you know we're at 2,500 feet or 3,000 feet and we're traveling at 120 to 140 <laughs> miles an hour and, and so sometimes it's, it's pretty difficult to tell exactly what an issue is. But we'll try to record on the on the computer screens where we see something that doesn't look right, and and then we'll try to go down later and ground truth those. We we try to give an attribution of what we suspect is the problem while we're in the airplane, and, and then we'll go back and try to ground truth that. Um, so we we saw a, um, a lot of thin crowns, and and a lot of it we think had to do with the heavy seed crop. Uh, yeah. So we did see a lot of uh, above normal precipitation uh, early in the season through April and May that even led to some flooding. Um, you can see here, uh, this is for Otter, Otter Creek uh, in Rutland and it, it got up into the major flooding stage. Um, the wet conditions exposed leaves just as they were emerging to uh, conditions that are conducive to fungal infection. And later on in the season, we did in fact find anthracnose, and we'll talk a little bit more about that a little later. We do monitor the development of maple sugar uh, buds every week through the spring uh, at a spot in Underhill uh, and, and we're trying to determine the phenology, the, the timing of both the bud break and of leaf expansion and we've been doing that continuously now for 29 years so we're beginning to you know establish a, a body of data and we evaluate the proportion of the tree crown in each of, we have eight stages of uh, bud development. Uh, here are some pictures that just as examples uh, show a little bit of the progression. We have a little bit more uh, refined uh, definitions. So altogether there are four, four other stages that we, we uh, identify. And, and so, so we, we look at a crown and, and we average our observations so uh, that we can then compare that to our long-term data set. Does that make sense? Did I say that right? Okay. Good. And this year, you can see that bud break uh, 
happened right around the long-term average. But then you can see that there was a, a, a time where actual expansion of the leaves stalled out for a little while. And that resulted in, um, in full leaf out being six days later than our long-term average. Even though this year was six days later, nevertheless, the long-term average you can see here uh, is a continuing trend for an earlier spring. And, and that, that's a, our 29 years of data right there. You can see that the average bud break for in sugar maple is getting a little earlier. These were done all at the same location. The, yeah, this is all done in Underhill. So I, I mentioned pear thrips, um, which is uh, a not native, uh, non-native insect. Um, and in some years, we get some early season defoliation from thrips, uh, but not, not this year. Um, Insects feed on the leaves just as the buds are opening and just as the leaves are beginning to emerge. And, and this is kind of typical thrips damage. Um, you also, you can feel on the, on the petioles of the leaves, you can feel little bumps from where they had laid their eggs. And, uh, and this year wasn't so bad. While we monitor for bud development, um, we also set out sticky traps to try to uh, capture the thrips and, and quantify their population levels uh, and that gives us a sense of what uh, damage might be coming along. And, and this year we actually saw a slight reduction from last year and, and you can see as you look towards the right of the graph there that um, numbers have been you know, relatively low compared to some of those spikes where we actually had some real significant uh, impacts. So, um, so this year throughout the state, we had no significant defoliation uh, from thrips. And if you're not familiar, um, you know, there's a, a picture of an, a mature adult and it's on this, this, this lighter green portion here is is a, a rib on a leaf it's a vein on a leaf and and so they're they're <coughs> real real tiny they're less than two millimeters long and real slender so that's pear thrips uh forest tent caterpillars are probably m more on your mind in recent years uh we, we had an outbreak uh, that started a couple of years ago and uh, it was this time around centered a little further in the in the north uh, in northeast in Vermont. Um, I started working with the department back 12 years ago, and we were finishing up a cycle, an outbreak uh, that was more severe down here in the south than at that outbreak than it was in the north. Um, uh, so the outbreak did spread along the greens, and there was a little bit down here in the southeast, uh, a little more into the southwest. But I think I think we have uh, th this is what it looked like. <laughs> so the uh, mountain in the rear is where it outbroke. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and I I I hate the time when we have to do aerial surveys because I just feel this tremendous pressure, you know, at that elevation and then at that speed to make a good call on what I'm seeing down there. And uh, some things are just so difficult to discern, but this one was like, oh, good. <laughs> I know exactly where it is and I know exactly what it is. It's, it's very distinct when you're looking at it. Um, but yes, that, that's, that browning off color is, is is tent caterpillar and you can see it there on that uh, slope on the left side of that ridge uh, this darker area is just clouds uh, sh shadows from clouds
So I... Oh, no, it wasn't backwards. Okay, there's 2016. And then the next year, you see a little bit more red. And you see it coming down into the southwest a little bit. And for those of you that are local down in uh, Wyndham County, there's, there's a, a little batch of it uh, up through Putney, Westminster area. And there's 2018. And, and sorry, I've gone to black and white, but now in 19, it, it seems to have kind of dried up. Now, those were all for defoliation. They, they die after they're a caterpillar so spread. Right, right. The the caterpillars will will drop down to the ground and and or they'll they'll form cocoons. Whether it's on a sometimes they'll bend a leaf over and and make a cocoon and they'll go through metamorphosis and and then emerge as adults as moths and fly. It's the caterpillars that do the defoliating. So you can keep them from spreading at the ca uh, when yeah. they go into the cocoon. Is that when you can? Uh, the time they're try most to eliminate them. The the time that they're most vulnerable and the time where we would normally try to control them would be in the caterpillar stage, uh, and then use uh, sprays, uh, particularly BT Bacillus thuringiensis based products. So, so the uh, defoliation has decreased quite a bit from last year. And, uh, of course, obviously the range. So we think that the outbreak status is over. But that's kind of a composite. 71,000 acres you see down there at the bottom uh, defoliated. Oh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. Okay, so, uh, so we put out traps to catch the moths, uh, which help us to get an idea of what the caterpillar populations will be like in the next season. And, and you can see that our moth catches, uh, here's this previous outbreak, that big spike in the middle of the graph. Um, I had just come on, just started working for the department back then. And uh, you can see that there's a pretty good correlation. The moth trap catches uh, are, are a pretty good indication of what the population is going to be like in the coming year. Um, the, to then translate into what will defoliation be like next year is a little more tricky because there's so many variables of weather and disease and, and, and availability of food and so on that go into how much next year's caterpillars actually eat. Okay, so, so we get a really good idea from our moth catches about what the population is going to be like how much the population is going to eat is, is a little less of a solid, you know, prediction. Um, but you can see here, as we got into 2018, that the moth catches are going way down. So we think the outbreak is, is ending. Let me finish that first. What we've seen is, if you remember, the few summers prior to that, we had some very, very dry times. There were a couple of years that we got into meteorologically defined drought. Um, and particularly down here in, uh, in this part of the Upper Valley, we, had, we got into some severe drought for a while. And, and the impacts of that will last for, for a while. And so even though we've had more rain, we had so much rain that we had an anthracnose problem this year, <laughs> still... Uh, the damage to fine roots and so on continues on for a little while. The impacts of, of those other stresses are going to last for a little while. And, and so when you combine uh, feeding from something like forest tent caterpillar with abnormally dry s seasons, uh, the trees suffer a little setback. Now, forest tent caterpillar defoliation happens early enough in the season that the trees are often able to refoliate. They'll put a second flush of leaves out 
um, and and try to you know get a little more opportunity to photosynthesize and, and have the energy they need uh, to survive. But we didn't see very much of that in this season. Um, the refoliation, uh, for a variety of reasons, just didn't rise up to the level that we thought we would see, the, the normal level. And we think part of that goes back to the abnormally dry times that we've had in the past. Um, Heavy seed production also just was taking some of the tree's energy away, probably kept it from putting out as many new leaves as possible. And, and then also, and I mentioned we'd get back to this anthracnose, but we also had the presence of anthracnose, uh, which can just uh, continued to impact the tree's ability to refoliate. So, so here's a picture of typical uh, defoliation. and. The good eyes, somebody saw the caterpillar there. I had not noticed that. Um, and, and this is the, the kind of exfoliation <coughs> that we were experiencing much, much less than what we expected, much less than we saw in the previous cycle of an outbreak. Um, the trees just didn't have the energy to put on a lot of new leaves. I don't think they had the desire to. Because <laughs> mine tried to refoliate three times. The third time, the leaves are about the size of a pinhead. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Bossonar was one that was really, really bad. They ate everything. They didn't just eat maples. They ate they every get... leaf. They ate every goldenrod, every weed. There was literally nothing left. Yeah. That was amazing. Yeah, they'll get into they even the ashes hickory. and pardon me. They even ate the hickories. Yeah, ashes and hickories and and they'll, lots of other things. I, I, there's going to be a picture in here. They don't eat red maple. They did. Don't know why. They ate the red maple. They ate everything. That's very unusual. Yeah, they ate the ferns. Everything. There was nothing. It was like a wasteland. Yeah. When they yeah. Well, anyways, so, so you're, you're, thank you. I should send you a check. Um, that's, <laughs> no, that's, <no. laughs> that's, a, that's a great segue, though. Even though we're seeing a decrease in the amount of defoliation as we fly the state, we're beginning now to see some mortality. Some trees that were stressed for several years in a row by not just the feeding, but also by dry conditions and, and perhaps other factors, site factors are, are really critical. Um, our uh, experience is that trees on better <coughs> sites generally are better able to resist the impacts of multiple stressors. Um, but there, there may be local factors that also play into which trees survive and which don't. Um, but we are now beginning to see some mortality in those areas that had been defoliated for a couple of years in a row. And, and so there is a map of, of what we picked up uh, this year as mortality. And, and here um, you, you can see on the left-hand side is we've combined uh, the, the, the mapped areas of defoliation over 2016, 17, 18, and 19 all combined and then when you compare that to where we're beginning to see the mortality uh, you can see that they're they're correlated perfectly and and so th the dieback is is because of uh, multiple assaults by tent caterpillar very likely compounded by the the drought before I leave uh, uh, forest tent caterpillar uh, there are methods of detection and, and, you know, if ever you were to hear that, that frass fall in the summer and, and we're worrying about are we going to have issues with tent caterpillars, you can give us a call. 
um, and we can come by and, and show you how to look for egg masses and how to predict uh, population levels in the next season. Um, and indeed, that's actually something you sugar makers can do yourself. But we can come by and show you how to do it, and then you can continue on with that. Basically, they're all done by June. Yeah, yeah. But then you got the then you got the moths uh, in June, mid June, late June, I think it was. Right. So, so, but what I'm saying though is for sugar makers who are concerned and curious about what next year will hold, uh, we can come by and, and show you how to look for the egg masses and, and based on number of egg masses, make uh, estimates of what your populations are going to be next season. Okay, uh, let's see, push the button here. And we'll just move on. So, um, you know, early in the season, I mentioned it was quite wet in April and May. And, and then uh, later in the season, we saw the anthracnose that was uh, made possible by those wet springtime conditions. the anthracnose? Um, I, I would say that, do we ever get rid of it? No. But on years when you have quicker developing seasons, uh, drier springs, uh, warmer springs, that the presence of anthracnose would be at a lower level and not cause a lot of issues. Uh, when you have those cool, wet, long-lasting springs, those are perfect conditions, and so the anthracnose levels will be greater and more obvious. But uh, the spores are just going to be around, you know. Um, I tell you, people trying to grow pine trees, I don't know if you've noticed, but for the last six, seven, eight years in a row now, the pine trees are taken a wallop by some other fungal diseases of foliage that are particular to uh, pine trees. And we just have had this string of cold, wet springs so that they don't, th these, these uh, complexes, it's actually several different fungi in the case of the pine trees, but these complexes just aren't going away. <laughs> And uh, so now it's been multiple years and the pine trees now are beginning to show signs of reduced vigor and even some mortality. Their, their uh, wood increment growth is declining and, you know, it's similar kind of a process. So no, we, it, it kind of always be around. We just need to look for good spring conditions. Um, Yeah. So in addition to the anthracnose, at about the same time, we started seeing the maple leaf cutter too. And this is a late season defoliator. Um, I believe it's a, a native insect. Um, and, and given that it's a late season defoliator, uh, it doesn't have as much of an impact on the tree's vigor and, and, and health because the trees had the opportunity to do a lot of photosynthesizing. and. And, and produce a bunch of carbohydrates. So um, it's certainly not much to look at. Uh, there are areas on, um, now I'm, I'm getting my geography wrong now, but uh, is it the Ataquichi River that goes along Route 4 if you were to drive from like Woodstock to... I was driving along there and, and at kind of mid-elevation levels and in some places right down to the river, uh, and it was always on the other side of the river from where I, the road was. Yeah, there was a lot of it through there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I stopped and I got my binoculars out and I was looking, what the heck is all that? And I finally figured out that it was maple leaf cutter. Just, you see bands of it and, and boy, they were just I hammering. the worst I've ever seen any place. We, we saw some 
two seasons ago that seemed to be the precursor for what we had this past season. Yeah. And, and then after discovering, you know, what it looked like from a distance and learning what it was, I began to see it everywhere. And then I was driving on, um, is it Route 131, I think, that goes from Ludlow down towards Windsor? And, and that, I think, might be the Black River, maybe? I'm failing on my geometry here. Uh, ge <laughs> That's a joke. Um, anyways, anyways, along that river, um, I was seeing it. It was real bad. I got out. I took some specimens. Um, I, think, I think one of these pictures actually came uh, from, from something I took. Um, but what I found, though, was that it was on yellow birches as well. It's known as maple leaf cutter, but just like sometimes uh, a tent caterpillar, a forest tent caterpillar will get into the red maple even though they're not supposed to, we found it on beech and yellow birch as well. Um, so we're not quite sure about uh, what this insect is going to do next year, um, but thankfully at least it's a late season defoliator. If nothing else, we've got that going for us. Um, okay, so, um, oh, I, I did want to just let you know, uh, there wasn't a slide made for it, but uh, we did map the combination of anthracnose and maple leaf cutter from the air, and statewide we had a little over 28,000 acres of it. Here in Windham and Windsor County, we had roughly 1,200 acres that we mapped uh, of these two combined. Uh, again, sometimes from the air, it's hard to really differentiate, um, but they come at the same time. They have the same kind of impact uh, by just reducing photosynthetic area. Um, yeah, so um, despite the, the thinning and the browning that we saw because of maple leaf cutter and anthracnose, we still ended up having a pretty good year for foliage. Uh, which I know <laughs> it, it doesn't make money directly, but it does make money for all of us by bringing tourists here. So it's, in, it's important. Uh, we monitor that uh, up in Underhill, just like we do in the beginning of the season, bud break and, and leaf expansion. Uh, in the fall, we monitor full uh, color development and the timing of the leaf drop. And, and those, those phenologies are important uh, for us. And uh, again, actually turned out to be a pretty good year. Peak color and leaf drop continued uh, to occur later in the season than we've seen in that 29 year stretch where we've been collecting that data. Um, last year, peak color was right about at the long term average and leaf drop occurred more rapidly uh, because we had a lot of wind events. So. Um, leaf drop was early um, but the long-term trends for both the spring bud break and in the fall for the final leaf drop um, both are yeah that one yep I just wanted to get that sure. yeah that one yep so we are recording this too just so you know so okay. the whole presentation at least in theory the whole presentation should be okay. on our website when I whenever I get them loaded up on the Cool. You won't be there this afternoon? <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> Sorry, Mark. Sorry. <laughs> I got to draw a line somewhere. <laughs> so all in all, um, you know, the, the trees were, were getting the water that they were missing a few years ago. Um, dieback and, and crown transparencies and stuff have been looking pretty good statewide. Um, and, and so we kind of feel like the tent caterpillar issue is beginning to recede. Uh, we're not quite sure where maple uh, leaf cutter is going, but it, it's covering smaller areas than, than the uh, forest tent caterpillar was. And so overall, we kind of feel like uh, things are, are kind of looking up for sugar maple health. You talked about drought. So, uh, we, know, I heard an analogy where drought is uh, a little bit like heart disease for a tree and that it's, it's potentially very impactful but you don't really see the effects outwardly so much whereas like an ice storm or a wind event it's really dramatic but 
outwardly it's dramatic, but from the tree's perspective, assuming it's reasonably healthy, you can compartmentalize that wound, and you know, we see it as being devastated, just like a defoliation can look here like devastation, but trees have tremendous capacity. Drought is doesn't get nearly enough credit for the impact that it has on, on tree health. Mm -hmm. so, uh, yeah. yeah. And th those ash trees being, you know, threatened by uh, the emerald ash borer are, are probably more susceptible to drought injury than maples. Uh, and and the you know, one-two punch is is really making a big impact. We're we're beginning to map out uh, ash to full, ash mortality now as well. So, what's the other thing killing the ash besides the ash? Well, the drought has had a major, major impact just, on just ash just health. Yeah, ash is a species that's very, very susceptible to fluctuations in moisture for its roots and and fine roots died and it's taken a while for them to be replaced and, and then at least in this part of the state there's a, a, a disease called ash yellows that uh, affects uh, apical dominance it, it slows growth it causes the bark to slough off uh, it can be very detrimental to vigor and trees eventually will will die. Uh, my understanding is that when emerald ash borer was first noticed in the Detroit, Michigan area back in the early 2000s, that they think that the insect had actually been there for since the 1990s. But people saw declining trees and just chalked it up to ash yellows, you know? So it's kind of lends itself to a similar sort of decline and, and people uh, just thought it was more ash yellows and didn't look into it closely and then all of a sudden realized there was something else involved too. Anything? Yeah, please. Uh, um, what does the state do in terms of getting involved in repopulating those areas, like where the tank caterpillars and all that die off? Do you we, have a program where you get involved in any way in that? Beyond technical advice, no, no. Um, and and again, forest tent caterpillar is a native insect, and right. and so the the give and take of uh, between the insect and the native trees uh, usually kind of takes care of itself. Certainly, a uh, sugar bush is a more intensely managed area than just native plain old forest that's not being tapped every year. Uh, so there are more considerations, uh, but we, we don't have any like replanting programs or, or anything like that. Um, and, and again, mortality is significant to someone that's tapping, um, but through silviculture and so forth, you can usually keep a forest going beyond an outbreak. Um, so, so, you know, it would go on a case-by-case -case basis, the, the specific kind of recommendations that we might make. Um, but just trying to avoid other stresses is probably one of the bigger things that you can do, which is why sometimes people elect to go ahead and spray their sugar bush just to protect that foliage so they don't experience the stress of losing all that photosynthetic area. The, the trees then only have to contend with drought, not drought and defoliation. That kind of an approach, mm -hmm. but uh, we don't have a specific program. Yeah, considering that it takes 40 years right. to get a maple to tapping, so I'm not sure Thank mm -hmm. you. 
those those maps um, are uh, published every year. Uh, it's it's being worked on it for 2019. It hasn't been published yet, but um, you can go to our uh, website and look for the forest health conditions report, and and maps of that style are there. You know, going back many years, and and the 2019 report will come out soon. Yep. Okay, great. Yeah. I'm just curious, how long does it take you to do the flyovers of a state of Vermont? 